evening church and it's camp meeting time. Let's begin the service tonight. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Let's stand together, please. Oh, let's sing it together like a mighty crusade choir tonight. Lift it up on the verse together now. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the tonight now on the second fear not I am with thee yes there you go sing on for I am thy God and will still give thee all strength and thee Church, it's good to be in the Lord's house this beautiful Wednesday night, right in the middle of uh, the month of June, and the Lord's given us tremendous weather. We're looking forward to a wonderful service together, and of course, we welcome Pastor and Mrs. Treber home, and we're so honored to have them back with us tonight, and we'll look forward to hearing from Pastor here this evening in a little bit. I've got some special guests here. My brother-in-law and sister and nephew are here from Woodland. And Ben Rogers is a senior this fall in high school looking for a Bible college. And so if you have one, you can recommend. And we'll just tie him down here. And so we're glad to have him here. And I also saw Mike and Natalie Strofe. I haven't had a chance to talk to them from Kentucky. And I thought I saw them over here. But we're honored to have you here tonight. We have a few tour groups uh, this evening. One in Texas. So let's remember them in the service there tonight. And one in Virginia that will be in Ohio tomorrow night for another service. But let's pray for the tour group. Brother Whitlow, I saw back here, he's got a beautiful gold and uh, yellow and blue tie on. I said, that looks like a Golden State tie if I've ever seen one. So maybe we'll send him on the road with another group here. But uh, we're glad you're here tonight. Let's commit this service to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so honored to be in your house tonight. We thank you for your goodness to us. You're an amazing God. Thank you for bringing our pastor, Mrs. Treber, home safely. We know where they've been uh, rested, and we thank you for that. We're excited about, Lord, the news that we're going to hear tonight from our pastor and his leadership. We thank you for him. What a gift he is uh, to our church. And I pray, God, that you would anoint Brother Cooper now as he preaches this evening. We thank you for the series here in Nehemiah, Lord, how you've used it in each heart. I pray again tonight, Lord, we'd hear from heaven. 
Lord, I ask that you take control of every aspect of this service. Minister to us through song tonight as well. Be with every congregational and every special. We'll be careful to give you the praise for it. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. I surely enjoy singing with you here in our stadium, in our tents. Here's a grand song. Let's enjoy it together. Till the storm passes by. Many of you, this is your favorite song. All oh, join us along. In the dark of the midnight, have I long in my face until the storm passes by. Lift it up on the first. In the dark of the midnight, have I all hid my face while the storm, oh yes, and there's no hiding place mid the crash of the thunder, precious Lord. Hear my cry, keep me safe until the storm. Ah, oh, sing that chorus together. Oh, till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the clouds roll forever from the sky. stand in the hollow of thy head. Oh, keep me safe till the storm. Oh, sing that last together now. Oh, when the long night has ended and the storms come no more, let me stand in thy presence on that bright peaceful shore in that land where the tempest never comes. Lord, may I dwell with thee when the storm passes by. Shout it out now until the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more. Trust in Jesus, I've learned to trust. 
trust in God through it all, through it all, I learn to depend upon His Word. Yes, I Thank you, fellas, and thank you for being here tonight. We have the air conditioner on. We took all the walls off the tent, and I tell you what, I wish we could do this all the time. We've tried to have been keeping you warm, but it's beautiful tonight. If you're watching online, if you're in the parking lot one or parking lot two out there, we welcome you in these tents, and it's just been a wonderful day. And uh, I'll say more at the close of the service, but I do want you to know we uh, have um, approval from all agencies we're moving back in on June 27th and uh, it's going to be great all guys people said amen I've been so concerned about your reaction because um, I've had more people say I don't know if I'm ready to go back in you know that was that's really God working in our hearts because who wanted to come out but now we got here and instead of complaining God allowed uh, you allowed God to conquer it and I'm just so very proud of God's people. You've been so great through all this. And um, yet I told the deacons last night, and they were just so excited. We have about 35-minute prayer and deacons meeting. And I met with all of our staff today, and they're all excited about it. And now your reception to that. It's going to be a wonderful event. We'll say more about that later tonight. Take your bulletin. Raise your hand if you need a bulletin tonight. And we'll get one to you just as quickly as possible in all the tents. And there's some in tent eight over here. Is there an usher right over here? We've got one, Brother Jose. Thank you. Way in the eight, at, at tent eight. Anybody else? One through four over here. That is great. It's wonderful. What a beautiful night. Tomorrow night's going to be a beautiful night. It's baseball night. First teams are playing at 515. So far, we've had 13 men hospitalized. And, uh, oh, my goodness gracious. But it's been fun. It's been enjoyable. And tomorrow night, two games, to, uh, two uh back-to-back -back games, 515 and whatever the other one is right after there. I do want you to know that that Saturday is uh, an important day, Faithfulness Rally at 915 and tents number uh, six, five, six, seven, and 8 over here. And then we want to have, um, uh, looking forward to the buses on Saturday at 1030, men's prayer this week and next week. We've been averaging now, I'm not talking about the Spanish service over there and what they're having in their services and prayer meeting. They have a big crowd. All during COVID, we are averaging about 100 men a Saturday for prayer. And I'd like to take it up to 150 this week, last time outside. And then next Saturday, first time back inside, I'd like to take it up to 200 men on Saturday night. And tonight, if you're visiting, you're not a member, you ought to come to prayer, be part of it. Uh, the pastors here often say it's like revival. We sing, we pray, we have a great time together. And that's at 8 o'clock on Saturday night. This Saturday night will be in these tents right here. Uh, uh, bring, bring your son. These are days that we'll never forget. But how tragic if you don't at least have one time at men's prayer. You want to be here, and I hope that you will be here. After the service tonight, there's a note, by the way, uh, and that number three announcement, uh, we need several men. I don't know how many men, but I know Brother Russ needs men here. We're taking things out of the front of this, getting ready for youth conference. And then um, we need about 10 men in the auditorium. It's a very easy job, very short job, five, ten minutes at the max. But we have a grand piano we have to move from one area to the next. So to go on a dolly, but you have to put it on its side. And so 10 strong Men, if you can, corral practice right afterwards. Sunday, Sunday school, 945. Did I tell you it's Father's Day? Ladies, did you hear that announcement? It's Father's Day. I don't know. I love the Mother's Day is first. Personally, I spent $6,000 on my wife. Well, maybe it wasn't 6000 but a lot less than that. But, uh, ladies, we do what we can so we can sow so that one day we can reap. It's reaping time. 
I would suggest gifts like a tie clip, socks, handkerchiefs, and a $2 tie might be very good men. Number five, those announcements are all important. July 4th will be in the building, and it's red. You see it there? Number five, red, white, and blue. I want to take you over to announcement number 11 tonight. And uh, this is the last two weeks of uh, what has been given to the anniversary offering. And it's going to gear up the big offering. It's five Sundays that are left, June 20th, 27th, July 4th, 11th, then the anniversary offering on the 18th. But these are warm-up. Every Sunday some folks are giving. And if you need, uh, you can give online. Or right now the ushers are making their way through the tents, through the church, and getting you an offering envelope. Everyone ought to have, every child. I don't care how much it is. It could be a nickel. It could be a penny. Every child needs to learn on anniversary Sunday to give something. All God's people said, amen. amen. So I hope you remember that. I want to say number 12 is my last announcement. And um, you can see that this is a just a horrendously low offering. We have done so great during COVID, way over the budget, doing great. And the last three weeks, it's been very, very low. You see these offerings there. And um, it takes about $187,000 a month to keep this ministry going, a little bit more than that, a lot of money. And I hope that you'll uh, pray that this Sunday we'll get that taken care of. I've only announced this twice. I had the minute prayer note about this. But on June 30th is the end of the fiscal year. We could use a gift of 200000 for the Christian school. We know going into the year, every year we're going to be short. We, choose, we charge less than any other school in the county. No school is as inexpensive as we are. I know of one Christian school. Ours is about 300 and some dollars a month. I know of one school, it's 50000 per child a year. Not very far from here. A lot of money. And um, know some schools that are very similar to ours that are eight, nine hundred a month. But um, our, our schools for our members only. And our members are already tithing and building the building. So we've tried to keep it low, but we're 200,000 short. And COVID's had an effect on us. You know that. And then the college is really not that bad. It's 300,000 short. But after what all we've gone through, it's just amazing. I'll throw that out there. Maybe there's someone that wants to meet one of those needs or both, and, of course, uh, we'll take care of that. Brother Martinez, I'd like you to come up here and help us with this song tonight. We were in the tent singing at Ben's prayer meeting about two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And I asked the fellows, what's your favorite song? And we sang I Am. Brother, Brother Nick, uh, who's on security here in the parking lot, said, I, I like that I Am. And I don't know, is it in your bulletin tonight? Is it in there? I am. I think you know it. When it was dark down in my heart, God's always there. I wish you could hear on the internet the people singing the tents. We don't have the microphone, so you just hear Brother Martinez. But it's going to be great. Let's learn it together. You sing the first stanza. We'll join you on the cars. Could you do that, please, Brother Martinez? When it was dark down in my heart, you brought life to me, a child of darkness, became a child What a day that was, light. amen, in darkness and then in light. And when my soul was dry, and I needed a drink, the water of life. Came to Sing it me. together. I am, I am. Jesus said, I, I am, am, I am. Jesus said to me, I am Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha, beginning and the I end. am Omega, the in between. The in between. Oh, I am. Jesus said to me, I'll be, I'll be what it takes to, to meet, meet your need. You were the widow's cruise of oil, old Elijah 
precious meat. You were shelter for Brother Noah, shepherd for the sheep, and in the fire. You were that, yes, you you were that for yes, them. Yes, amen. Yes, you And were. a cloud by day, and a fire by night for your children. Let's all sing it together. I am, I am. I am, I am. Jesus said to me, I am Alpha and Omega. I am Alpha. I am Omega. The in between. The in between. said to me I'll be what it takes to meet your need. Thank you for singing that. Thank you, Brother Martinez. We all prepare for the offering of course tonight and uh, is for the end of the year. We end the year in the black, the fiscal year. And um, you, you've been so good. God's people have been so good. And I'll tell you more about moving in the auditorium when we do, but it's going to be a great day just to thank what you allowed God to do. It's so, such a privilege to pastor people like you. And I thank God for what you've done in prayer. It, it's, it's regular you just see someone kneeling on the steps for 443 days, just regular. It's regular to see mothers kneeling in the grass over at the school, praying that God would open up the school, and he did. It's been a miracle watching people just walk around this property praying, and of course during prayer times, various times. It's been a miracle to watch you stay at home when we went to that 3,000-seat auditorium, about five or six of us, and preached an empty auditorium, and it had to be terrible listening at home online. It had to just be terrible. I never experienced it one time, but I just can't imagine it. And uh, it, 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 all, all you've done, the parking, there's no parking, taking the shuttles in, the giving, what you've done, has just been over the top. Ushers, please come. And uh, I want to thank you so much. It is my prayer that the Spirit of God would convey to you how grateful I am. Uh, I don't love you just because of all you do. But how could a pastor not love you for that? We're going to receive the offering you can give online. If you're watching online and for our members that are home, we appreciate you. And I love you so very much. And thank you for your faithfulness. So, so many are sick and with cancer and other needs. And thank you for being faithful. I know right now I can think of just dozens of people that are watching. And what a joy to be your pastor. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, I pray your blessing upon the offering tonight. I, I thank you for the way these people have just dug deep for 15 months. We never turn to the government for sustenance. We turn to thee, and you've met the needs. You've been so good to us. I thank you that during COVID, we paid the debt down more than any other year in the history of our church. I thank you for the faithfulness of the tithes and offerings, the attendance, running the buses on Saturday, all that these people have done. I thank you for their willingness to just jump in and be what they should be. Bless the offering tonight. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. On the piano tonight, one of our boys left over from the school, Brother Matt Brown is from Massachusetts, and he'll play for us tonight the offertory.
get so vexed by this world that we're in, by battles and struggles and the heartache of sin. Oh, Satan's attack, the church of today. a smooth one who puts on a show don't sing us those old songs about dark calvary just sing us a new song and happy we'll be but i'd like to tell That's a good song. It's a pretty good looking woman that sang it too. I'm going to have to get her phone number. All right, take your Bible, Nehemiah chapter number 6 tonight, please. Nehemiah chapter number 6. And uh, I want to give you the truth for tonight. It sure has been good to be in church this evening. And uh, it's good to hear about what God's done, but what God's got in store. We can't even have words to express or comprehend exactly what God's going to do, but it's going to be good. And we're looking forward to getting back inside our church auditorium here very soon. And great things are in store. Nehemiah chapter number 6 tonight. We're going to read verse number 1 down through verse number 4. And tonight the message will be a uh, sort of a positional message. But more important than that, it's a Bible message. It's a doctrinal message. And it's the expectation of God for every single believer and for our church as well. I want you to look at it with me, Nehemiah chapter number 6. If you're able to stand, please stand with me. It's warm tonight, and you're not all wrapped up in your snuggies or anything like that. And so we can stand up and read the Bible together. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass, when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the, that I'd built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, by the way, I circled that word heard. It's amazing how caught up, how eaten up, how wrapped up in Nehemiah's life Sam Ballant and Tobiah was. 
Nehemiah just wants to build the wall, and all they care about is what's Nehemiah doing. Can I just say, if that's you, get a life. It's amazing if you'll just go do something for God, how you'll quit worrying about what everybody else is doing. That's good preaching, I think. Verse number 2, That Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease whilst I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent unto me, look at this, four times after this sort. And I answered them after the same manner. In verse number two, these enemies of Nehemiah try to persuade him to come down from his wall and meet with them. In fact, they do it not one time, but four times. They say, just come, let's just get together on this thing. Just calm down a little bit, get off the wall, we just want to meet with you. And persistently, they try to get Nehemiah to compromise. And notice this, compromise always requires you to lose your higher ground and to come down. Nehemiah is persistent in his refusal. And he said, why, why should I come down? I'm not coming down. For a little while this evening, I want to preach on this thought. I'm not coming down just so we can come together. I'm not coming down just so we can come together. Now, I love our church today, but I'm concerned with having a church like this in the future. And if we're going to have a church like this, not just for days, but for decades, if Jesus doesn't come, we've got to make the decision that we're not going to come down. We're going to hold the position. Let's pray. God, I pray for your help tonight to preach. I pray that you'd give me liberty, please. I pray that you'd give me energy and strength to preach, clarity. I pray you'd fill me with your spirit. Help our church, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. When I got saved, I got saved green. By that, I mean I did not get saved having been brought up in an independent, fundamental Baptist church. But I did get saved through an independent fundamental Baptist church. I didn't become an independent fundamental Baptist necessarily out of popularity or because it was even what I liked. I became an independent fundamental Baptist because of Bible conviction. I'm honestly convinced that this is as close to Bible Christianity as you'll find in a local church assembly in 2021. In fact, if I thought there was something else out there that was closer to the Bible, then I would leave this church right now and I'd go join whatever I thought was closer to the Bible. I found out when I first started to preach, I got invitations to preach for a lot of different places. Uh, they would hear me preach on the internet or hear me preach in a conference and preachers would call me from different denominations. My parents even at that time were in a different kind of denomination and they would ask me to preach at their church. And over and over again, I would just say simply, no, I wouldn't go there. I began to publish a newsletter, and on that newsletter, I made sure to put at the heading, Independent, Fundamental, King James Bible, Local Church, Baptist. Why did I do that? I wanted to declare what I was, because it kept me out of those kind of invitations to go places that I didn't want to go. One of the toughest tasks in the Christian life and one of the constant battles in the life of a local church is to keep themselves out of unequal or unedifying yokes. Or we could say it like this. It's to fight against the fleshly desire for fellowship at the expense of truth. The goal of the child of God and the goal for the local church as a whole is to keep itself pure, undefiled, and unspotted from the world. Church is not about what I desire or I like or I want. Neither Christianity. But church and Christianity is about obedience to the Bible and following the Word of God. Our allegiance ought to be to Scripture. Our loyalty is to truth. Our command is to maintain a biblical distinction in the areas of life, doctrine, and ministry philosophy. Our theme ought to be the line from the Battle Hymn of the Republic that says, His truth is marching on. Today there's a constant push on pastors. And there's a constant pull on Christians to come together. Fellowship is the big word right now. It sounds harmless on the surface and it seems positive, but tonight, lest we be caught up in this Trojan horse terminology, I want to remind us, fellowship is not my goal. Obedience to Christ and adherence to the Bible is my goal. 
as a believer, I am not pursuing fellowship. I should be married to Bible truth. Now, if you listen tonight to the average pastor sermon, or if you read the average book in the Christian bookstore, or if you let the keyboard theologian exhort you on their Facebook page, it's easy to see the banner of truth has been lowered and the flag of fellowship has been raised. Jude exhorted us to earnestly contend for the faith. But today we're being pressured to come down and come together. If you study Christian history, and more specifically, if you study our Baptist heritage, you find that fellowship was never what brought Christians together. Truth is what brought Christians together. Believers did not just get along to get along and then go along with the crowd. Rather, they came together around a body of Bible doctrine and then from a shared conviction on the truth, fellowship arose out of that position. I don't have to have fellowship, but I have to have truth. Now tonight, I want to have fellowship, and I desire fellowship. I want fellowship in my Christian life. But any fellowship I have ought to be birthed by commonality when it comes to what we believe in regards to the Bible. I want you to hear this statement. To court fellowship for the sake of fellowship is simply carnal. But to allow fellowship to be determined by Bible principle is simply Christian. Today we have it backwards. Modern Christianity comes together for fellowship at the expense of doctrinal truth. That's why you'll find in just about every city a ministerial association. And that association yokes together any kind of domination and any kind of stripe and any kind of doctrine into one big group. Never mind they don't believe the same things about the Bible. That's why so many churches today try to hide their denominational heritage and they use generic lingo to describe their assembly. That's why preachers who know better and I believe they believe better in their heart will preach with and preach for and model themselves after people that don't even believe the Bible is the perfect word of God. Here's the issue. They have allowed their desire for fellowship to overtake and outbattle their conviction on Bible truth. Our Baptist forefathers were known for what they were kicked out of, not what they yoked up with. I remember hearing Dr. Tom Malone preach, and he said there are too many preachers wanting to build bridges to every group out there. He went on to say, not me. I walk around with a box of matches in my pocket all the time, and I'm trying to burn every bridge that I can. Dr. John R. Rice was preaching a conference and he was preaching about old time religion, about the King James Bible, about soul winning in the local church and a woman preacher came. Now a woman preacher is as odd to God as a man giving birth to a baby. But a woman preacher came to hear him preach and she heard what he had to say. She walked up to him after and she said, I think all of that stinks. He said, I agree with you. It stinks. He said, I've been trying to get that stink on me for 35 years, and I don't want you messing with it. Can I say tonight, I am not interested in any part of building any kind of bridge that links our church to compromise or false teaching. There is little hope for truth to march on if we do not fend off the pressure to compromise the truth. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Paul was a much bigger emphasizer of avoidance than he was of association. Now it is sad, but it is true, that compromise seems to be to our generation what convictions were to Christians in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, they died for the faith. Today, Christians are simply dying to have fellowship. Let's come together is the theme of mainstream Christianity. But what bothers me is that line of thinking is making its way into Bible-believing Baptist circles as well. Now, by the grace of God tonight, I want to draw a line in the sand and I want to declare I am not coming down just so we can come together. I am not looking for a crowd 
Lord. I want to follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. And tonight I sure hope by the grace of God that I love Jesus and I love God and I love the Holy Spirit and I love the Bible more than I have a need to have fellowship or pals out there among the brethren. Now listen, I can be friendly to everybody, but I cannot be friends with just anybody. I can agree to get along to a degree, but I cannot agree to come together if it means I have to compromise one iota of the faith once delivered unto the saints. Tonight it amazes me how Christians love a bold, unapologetic politician that will proudly preach his platform position and at the same time they scorn and mock and belittle a preacher who does the same about his Bible position. It's a little weird to me to find these preachers that get so uptight about blurring gender lines in our culture and yet they blur the ecclesiastical lines in their churches. Tonight the same Bible that tells me to go in all the world and preach the gospel also calls me to come out from the world to not be yoked up with unbelievers and to withdraw from any brother that does not walk after the traditions that I have received. Oliver B. Green was making a joke but he said I'm so independent the termites in my church won't fellowship with the termites in the church down the road. Now tonight coming together is not God's purpose for our church. Conforming to the image of Christ is God's purpose for our church. We can rally around the truth but we cannot rally with those that oppose the truth. Not every church is biblical. Not every Christian book is profitable. Not every preacher is right. Not every Christian is worth your following. Not every organization that names the name of Christ is actually Christian. Paul asked the Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. Now that might sound harsh, but I believe that's the furthest thing from the preacher's heart. But I want you to hear this. Not everyone and not every place is right. And not everyone and every place that is doctrinally right is right for you or right for our church. Did you hear what I said? Not everyone is right. And not everyone who might be doctrinally right is all right for you to follow, read after, or yoke up with for your direction. I want you to hear this statement, perception is direction. If it looks wrong, then it's wrong. Say amen right there. Terminology is direction. If they don't say the right words, it's wrong. Philosophy is direction. If it's not the right philosophy, it is wrong. And my responsibility as a Christian and your responsibility as a Christian and my responsibility as a pastor is to know my Bible well enough to love God enough to be led by the Holy Spirit enough to discern between that which is right and that which is wrong and to follow after Jesus Christ to the best of my ability. There are some folks I don't want to hitch my wagon to. I can hug them. I can say God bless you. I can smile but I'm going to have to say no thanks and head the other direction. I heard about a farmer. He was out plowing his field in the spring and that field had lent lime frozen all winter and a snake had apparently frozen on that field. That farmer felt pity for the snake so he picked it up and put it in his shirt and as that farmer went to work the body heat began to thaw out that snake. That snake came to, revived, and as soon as it revived, it bit that man in the chest. That farmer reached in, grabbed the snake, threw it out, and said, I can't believe you do that. I saved your life. And the snake said, it's not my fault. You knew I was a snake when you picked me up. There's too many fundamental Christians picking up snakes for their bookshelf and snakes on their social media timeline and snakes on their text threads, and snakes on their sermon audio. Can I say we're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but we're to reprove them. I was driving through downtown San Jose, and I saw a church banner, and it says, We choose welcome. 
And what they meant by that is we welcome any and every kind of sin imaginable to come to our church. We'll welcome this. We'll welcome that. The only one unwelcome there would have been Jesus himself for what they stand for and believe. Now, my desire for fellowship can be met with fellowship in Christ, fellowship in the local church, fellowship in my Bible, and fellowship with fellow saints that believe like I do. I don't have to run to the world, and I don't have to run to a compromising church to find fellowship. There might be a day, I hope not, there might be a day when this church goes that direction. And if they do, I'll go over to America and preach against it. And I'll call out whichever one of you it is that makes it go that way. Say amen right there. I've been bought with a price. So I should not be for sale. I can't come down tonight. There's a great work to do. I'm not coming down for popularity. I'm not coming down for a platform. I'm not coming down to get a new pal. I'm not coming down to have a pulpit. I'm not coming down for a pat on the head. I'm not coming down for political reasons. I'm not coming down for a Pete's coffee card. I will not come down. Now, Nehemiah tonight is a courageous man. But more than that, he's a man of conviction. And I think the reason he was successful is that he knew how to say no when compromise knocked at his door. Nehemiah chapter 6 gives us an instance of opposition again to Nehemiah's work. It's amazing how the devil seeks to destroy the work of God. The remnant returned from captivity. Nehemiah has joined them to lead them in the work and the devil begins to fight. Now, the devil does not wage war with sword or spear or chariot, but rather he comes bearing an olive branch stretched out. The devil's crowd doesn't ride up with their guns in the air blazing. They come saying, hey, let's just get together and, and have a conversation. At first they threatened and they mocked, but when that didn't work, they said, let's just have a meeting. They said, let's build together. Let's meet together. Four times they pressured Nehemiah to come down and join their fellowship. They said, we can't scare Nehemiah off his perch. We can't shoot him off the wall. So let's just kill him through compromise. Now, Nehemiah was there for God. Nehemiah was there for the wall. But don't miss this. These other men had ulterior motives. It's amazing how wrapped up in Nehemiah's life these individuals were. Can you see it in your mind? The messenger of Sanballat goes to Nehemiah. The first invitation is, let's just have a cup of coffee together. That's harmless. Just a cup of coffee. Maybe we'll bring up a little bit of negative things about your church, but not many. Let's just have a cup of coffee together. Then he comes again and says, Nehemiah, how about you attend one of our conferences? We'll pay your way. We'll buy you a hotel. I might even let you preach in chapel, maybe. I don't know. But you just come attend one of our... It's not going to hurt you. Then he comes again. He says, Nehemiah, think of how much good we could do for our city if we just join forces and be friends. If we just make a committee together, we could get more work done. Finally, the messenger came and he said, here, I'll give you financial support. If you'll yoke up with me, you won't just be loved by the Jews. You'll be loved by the Gentiles as well. It kind of reminds me of the serpent in the Garden of Eden trying to sell that apple to Eve. It kind of reminds me of Satan when he tried to tempt Christ 40 days and nights in the wilderness. It kind of reminds me of old Pharaoh who said, Moses, you go worship, but don't worship very far outside of Egypt. It kind of reminds me of Ahab who tried to swim a, 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 a Naboth out of his vineyard. It kind of reminds me of Simon the sorcerer who thought he could buy the power of God off of Peter. Now I'm glad Nehemiah had enough grit and gumption and conviction to look him square in the eye and tell him, I am not coming down. I like what he did. He knew his purpose. He knew his calling. He had enough perception to see they had the wrong motivation and he said, no, thank you. I won't come down just so we can come together. I won't come down to your level. I won't get off track. I won't get out of the will of God. You can ask. You can bait. You can try. But I'm staying on the wall. I'm not coming down. I read a quote that said, A compromising Christian is in God's way instead of being a blessing to humanity. Now tonight, the Bible principle of separation, especially ecclesiastical separation, is not antiquated. It's not just a Baptist principle. It's not my principle. It is a Bible principle. Separation has been God's desire for us since the beginning of recorded history. It is not a preference. 
It's not a straw man. It's not peripheral. It's as much Bible as John 3, 16. In Genesis 1, God set that precedent as he divided light from darkness. Throughout the Bible, God gave examples of separation. He said, I don't want you plowing with two different kinds of animals. I don't want you to sow two different kinds of seed in one field. I don't want you to wear clothing made out of various types of material. He said, righteousness has no business with unrighteousness. Light has no business with darkness. Christ has no business with Belial. Uh, believers have no business with infidels. And the temple of God has no business with idols. Love is not breaking down walls and building bridges. But love is strengthening the walls and burning a bridge that would lead you to compromise and destruction. I thank God for a church that still has some standards. I thank God for some ch a church that still has a position on something. I thank God for some some Christians that still love their Bible more than they care about the love of this world. Can I say love is not tearing down the wall. Love is building up the wall. God has called us to come out from the world and anything worldly and anyone who doesn't believe the Bible and be separate. Can't we all just get along? That's what the compromiser asks. My answer is sure we can get along but we can't go along. We can get along all day but we can't come together. Now I'll get together with anybody that believes the King James Bible is the Word of God and believes Jesus was born of a virgin and believes the local church is right and it's a capital B Baptist and it's not part of a convention. I can get along with a lot of people, but I can't just get together with anybody. That's because our God is a jealous God. He created us for Him and His glory. Your life is not your own. Your life is for Him. And He wants to prosper you. And He wants to bless you. He wants to be your Father and you to enjoy that child a relationship with him but can I say yoking up the world severs that fellowship with God anything that dims our light anything that diminishes our distinction as an ambassador for Christ ought to be marked avoided and refused can you see that yoke that yoke was made for one kind of neck not two kinds of necks that yoke was to be built for two oxen or two donkeys not an ox and a donkey Today, even in independent Baptist churches, they're yoking oxes with donkeys. They'll yoke up the ox of the King James Bible with the donkey of contemporary music. Everybody all right? Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. They'll yoke up the ox of conservative services with the donkey of a contemporary youth's hour or service. They'll yoke up the ox of being called an independent Baptist church with the donkey of neo-evangelicalism when it comes to the atmosphere, the lighting, and the flavor of their church. Can I say God wants the gospel to go into all the world, but not at the expense of Bible truth. Yes, God wants our voice to be heard politically, but not at the expense of Bible truth. Yes, God wants our church to be filled, but not at the expense of Bible truth. We can't cannot come down tonight. Our church has to stay on the wall. We can't change our position. We can't compromise our stand. We can't give an inch on our, our belief tonight. We have to stay on the wall. If whatever it is or whoever it is makes you shout for Jesus quieter or makes your testimony weaker or makes your stand muddier or makes you closer to the world, you ought to avoid it. I believe our nation's in a crisis tonight because our church is are so caught up in compromise. We've come down from the wall to link arms and hold hands with too many things that have cost us our Baptist and biblical distinction. God help us. We'd have revival if preachers and Christians would avoid compromise like they did COVID. Uh-oh, here comes compromise. Keep your distance. Uh-oh, here comes compromise. Keep yourself clean. Uh-oh, here comes a, a compromise. Shut yourself in if you can't handle what's outside. Here comes compromise. Don't shake hands with that person. Here comes compromise. Be skeptical of what you read or hear on the news. I'm afraid we're living in a bridge-building generation, not a wall-building generation. 
But I believe there ought to be one church in America that's still in the wall building business. If we're going to have a church for our children and pass the baton of Bible truth on to another generation, we've got to have a deeper loyalty to the Bible than we have a longing for fellowship and acceptance in this world. We can fellowship around the truth, but we cannot go forward unless we have the truth. I say keep your popularity. I'll take the truth. You can keep your cooperation if it means I have to forfeit my truth. You can keep your results. I think I'll just take truth. You can keep acceptance in this world. I'll take the truth. I'll take truth for the sake of Jesus. I'll take truth for the sake of my family. I'll take truth for the sake of my spouse. I'll take truth for the sake of our state. I'll take truth for the sake of our nation. I'll take truth for the sake of our church. God has more grace tonight for a bartender than he does for a preacher that mishandles the word of God. Today we hear about liberty, but what they mean is license to sin. Today we hear about legalism, but what they mean is anybody with biblical standards higher than their own. Today we hear, well, it's just to further the gospel. We're gospel-centered, but it's always at the expense of a boatload of other Bible truth. This week, a leading Southern Baptist, he was the president of their convention last year, He said, you Pharisees in this place put too much ideological purity over your evangelistic mission. I want to say, duh. If I get a yoke up with people who don't believe the virgin birth to preach the gospel, then I think God would rather me just not yoke up. Because that's not the gospel anyhow. Well, pardon me while I preach a minute. We can't afford to come down. Don't come down if they don't believe the King James Bible is the word of God. Don't come down if they don't believe Jesus died for whosoever will. Don't come down if they're ashamed or quiet or try to hide the fact they're a Baptist. Don't come down if their wardrobe looks more like Hollywood than it does holiness. Don't come down if their buzzwords are relevant, gospel-minded, community-centered, instead of saying, I'm old-fashioned, I go soul-winning, and I'm Christ-honoring. Don't come down if they try to take the fire out of hell. Don't come down if they try to take the gold out of heaven. Don't come down if their music sounds secular or sensual. Don't come down if it leads to a winery or a beer glass. Don't come down if it undermines your pastor. Don't come down if it endangers your family. Don't come down if its product doesn't mirror Jesus. Jesus. Don't come down if it's a worldly atmosphere. Don't come down if it's a scornful attitude. Don't come down if it has no track record of success for God. Don't come down if it'll cost you more than it'll ever give you. You'd be better off to be a maverick for God than part of a mixed multitude for the devil. It might have a good motive, but if it has bad methods, I'm not coming down. It might have a good name, but if it has a bad direction, I'm not coming down. It might be a source that used to be right, but now it's gone wrong. I'm not coming down. It might be what the majority's doing, but if it doesn't line up with my Bible, I'm not coming down. I won't come down for the wrong book. I won't come down for the wrong buddy. I won't come down for the wrong cause. I won't come down for the wrong philosophy. I won't come down for the wrong doctrine. And tonight your family needs a daddy that'll stay on the wall. Your family needs a mama that'll stay on the wall. Our youth group needs some young people that'll stay on the wall. Our city needs a church that'll stay on the wall. Our nation needs some Christians that'll stay on the wall. Don't be a lot. Don't be an Elimelech. Don't be a Samson. Don't be an Israel. Israel, hey, stand and stay on the wall. Let me make a few statements and I'll close. Number one, seven statements. Listen to these. Here's some questions I ask myself before I yoke up with somebody. If I come down to come together, will God be glorified? If me coming down to join does not glorify God, then why in the world would I do it? And let me say right here is where pragmatism usually takes over. And pragmatism is ends justify the means. Well, if we just didn't wear our shirts at the beach and wore swimming trunks and if the women wore bikinis and hit a beach ball, we could win all those surfers to Jesus. God's not pleased with that because you just threw out the Bible principle of separation and modesty to do it. They say, well, look at all the results. God doesn't care about your results. God's worried about your obedience. Number one, if I come down, will God be glorified? If not, then don't come down. Number two, if I come down, will it cost me my convictions? I'm not going to yoke up with somebody who doesn't believe. I'll say it again. The Bible, the King James Bible is the word of God. 
My parents won't mind me saying this. They were in a church that didn't believe it. They used an NIV Bible. NIV Bible doesn't even have all the Bible in it. Takes out the blood. Takes out the virgin birth. Had a, a, a sodomite on the, uh, on the translating committee. And I was a young Christian, but I told my parents no. You say, what would it have hurt? It would have hurt my conviction. And tonight, for about 13 years now, my parents have been in a good independent fundamental Baptist church. Because they saw that, you know what, that's not right. And they went and got to a good church. Don't yoke up if it's going to cost you your convictions. Number three, if I come down, where will this relationship lead me tomorrow? Not what's it going to do for me today. Here's what I wish God's people could understand. You need to understand how to look at not what B will be, A to B. But you have to decide and dis dis discern and understand. Don't look from A to B. Look from A to F. It might be okay today, but where's it going to lead me tomorrow? I might get away with it for one meeting, but you know what I might find out? I like that Presbyterian preacher that believes you baptize babies. The next thing you know, I believe it. I'm just telling you, be careful. I don't look at somebody's disposition. Most young preachers are so, I mean, they're so Bible illiterate that they don't like an old man of God because he's so mean and authoritative. So then they'll run to his liberal, almost sounds like he's a, a got a boyfriend kind of preacher over there that doesn't even believe the Bible because he's so nice. I don't judge my yoke on disposition. I judge my yoke on position. I can deal with an old crab that believes the Word of God, but I can't deal with somebody who tells to tell me the Bible is not the Word of God. Thank you. Number four, if I come down to come together, what relationships will this develop in my life? If I yoke up with you... Who are you yoked up with? There's some guys out there that are fine in and of themselves, but the people they run with are not. And so I don't want to fellowship with them lest I get caught up in the other crowd. A good example of that would have been, not, but Billy Graham did that. And I wasn't alive through most of his ministry, but he started out fundamental. Fiery preacher, good preacher. But I saw an interview with him on Larry King where he said, I'm more sure of the Pope's salvation than my own. He didn't start out like that. That happened through the wrong kind of relationships that developed through some relationships that weren't that bad at the beginning. All right, number five. If I come down to come together, will it cause other Christians to stumble? Lot made the decision to go to Sodom. It costs Lot. I tell you what, it cost his wife and sons even more. Sons-in-law. Every Christian's a domino. And when you fall, it doesn't just affect you, but it affects a long line of people behind you. And you've got to ask yourself, I feel like I have liberty to go out there. I'm all right. I have liberty. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a preacher and everything, but I'm young and fairly in shape. i got liberty. I'm just going to go out there and wear my shorts and a sleeveless T-shirt around town because there's nothing wrong with that. Well, yeah, but then what if somebody else sees me doing that and causes them to stumble? Everybody all right? I know I'm, I'm old. I just don't look like I'm old. I know I'm 75 years old. Pray for me. Y'all are thinking, I can't wait till the old preacher dies. These young guys are soft. No, 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 no. Anyway, number six, if I come down to come together, will it confuse my generation in regards to who my God is? I don't want to yoke up the wrong crowd and make the world think, well, God doesn't care if you drink wine. Hello? I don't want to yoke up the wrong crowd and then they think, well, God doesn't care if you smoke cigarettes or cigars. Look at that, 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 that fellow runs with that crowd. They're okay with it, so it's probably, God, I don't want to yoke up that crowd. Well, God doesn't care about perversity. God's okay with that. I mean, ask yourself, is God carnal? Is church really that worldly? Is God no longer hard on sin? Is God into rock and roll? You say, well, no, he's not. Then you ought not run with people who pr project that he is. <laughs> Lastly, if I come down, what kind of a church, and this is the most important to me, if I come down, what kind of a church or what kind of a Christianity am I leaving my child? We have a stack of stones out here, a memorial. What meaneth these stones? And I'll tell you what I'm nervous about. There's a lot of younger men my age. They're crazy. They've gone off the reservation. Their heroes are men they've never met. They put more stock in something they've read in a tweet or a post than what a man of God instilled in them at his own feet over the years. And so they're having fun with church today. But my question is, what's it going to do to your children tomorrow? Every generation falls a little bit left of the previous. 
You say, well, I think he's too far to the right. Yeah, that's because if not, then we'll be all the way over here to the left. So every generation falls a little bit. So here's what it is. Well, let's just drop the standard a little bit. You drop it a little bit, your son and daughter are going to drop it a lot. Let's just tweak the music a little bit. You tweak it a little bit, then your children are going to tweak it a lot. Let's just cancel one of the services. That's fine, but then you're going to get down to only one service a week when your children take over. And then their grandchildren won't even know who Jesus is because they won't have any kind of church upbringing at all. I mean, I, what kind of worship am I going to leave my son? What kind of walk with God am I going to leave my son? What kind of a wedding am I going to lead him to? If I compromise, if I get worldly, what kind of woman is that little fella going to marry one day? I'm kind of concerned about that. All these things matter. It's bigger than your wants. It's bigger than your preference. There's another generation that needs an old-time religion church in their day. I'll close. I've seen, I've never seen, I've never seen a church that was right, go left, and then come back to the right. I've seen churches that were left, but never had been right. Somehow, it happens. I preached in one church in, 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 in the state of Pennsylvania that they didn't have Baptist in their name. It was a Bible church. And I don't preach in Bible churches. But this guy called me and said, I'm wanting to bring us out. He said, I thought you'd be a good preacher to get us out of this thing and make us independent Baptists. I said, I'm your man if that's what you want. I'll help anybody get out of Egypt. So I preached there uh, 13 times in one week. And they changed the name and put independent Baptist even in the name, which was a little bit more much, but they put independent Baptist in the name of the church. I've seen churches that were left become conservative. But I've never seen a conservative church like this, if it slides, come back. You never unrotten an apple. Once it's rotten, then it's rotten. Don't put the next generation at risk by compromising today. You notice whenever people have COVID, they don't put healthy people in with people who have COVID to make them better. And you and I aren't going to make our liberal buddies better by texting, tweeting, fellowshipping, and preaching for them and running with them. They're going to make you sick. Say amen right there. Tonight, I'm not coming down just so we can come together. I'm nobody. I'm nothing. But I've just decided by the grace of God, I just want to believe the Bible. And I just want to stay old-fashioned. I guess I don't know any better because I haven't been saved except for independent. That's all I've known. I, I got saved in Independent Baptist Church. They handed me an old Schofield Bible. Uh, they gave me a tract by John R. Rice, a subscription to the Sword of the Lord. And uh, that's all they did. And, and it ruined me. You had to pray for me. But can I say, I'm just convinced it's right. And it's still right for our church right now. He said, well, I don't like it. There's a lot of other churches, other places. But I think this church ought to resolve we're going to stay on the wall. Not coming down. I'm going to pray the altar is open. Here's the invitation. Would you come pray for our church? We're getting ready to move back in. We're going to move back in on the wall. We're not going to move back in and tweak it, alter it. It's going to be much more of the same old thing, just at a higher level. And why don't we come pray tonight that God will keep us in his will. And while everybody else is falling and the pressure is mounting, let's just follow the word. I don't want to be any more broad than the spine of my King James Bible. By the grace of God, I'm not coming down. Would you resolve to do that tonight? I'm going to pray. You come as the piano plays. Let's pray together. Let's bow our heads. Lord, I pray you bless the invitation now. Thank you for the attention of our church family. And God, they know. They're, they, they stand right. But thank you, Lord, for letting us preach truths like this and being received so well like it is. I pray you'd help our church. I'm concerned for our country. Churches that once stood, we can, li we can list them tonight. I pray this would be one that breaks that trend, and I believe it will. Help us to stay on the wall in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and play, Caleb. Altar is open. Men have come. Why don't you come tonight? Would you step up and come? Step out. If God's spoken to your heart, stand up where you are. Come pray. Let's come pray. This is the last Wednesday night, just us on the church property. Last Wednesday night as just us on this property. Have you prayed at the altar yet in the stadium? If not, you're missing out. This might be one of your last opportunities. It is a last opportunity with just us on a Wednesday night. Would you come pray by the grace of God? Let's not change. Don't cave in. Don't come down. Get a conviction. Stand by it. A firm belief in your heart. I'll die for that one. I'm, I'm not giving in on that one. We can get along, but we can't just go along to get along. We can be friends as far as that. We can be friendly, cordial, but can't get in the yoke with people who don't believe right. It will destroy our church. 
Ecumenicism is a dangerous thing. You say, well, where's your headquarters? It's in heaven. What's your guidebook? It's the Bible. What's your blueprint? The book of Acts. It matters, friend. Salvation by grace through faith matters. Baptism by immersion matters. The resurrection of Christ matters. The rapture before the tribulation matters. The local church that is led by a pastor with deacons, Lord's Supper, baptism, that matters. We've got to preserve, restrain. Righteousness exalteth the nation. Sin's a reproach. If you would mute what you see on your timeline while you're watching some of these churches, could you even tell it was a church if it was muted? Just by looking at it, you say, no, I couldn't even tell. That's, I don't think that pleases God. We're to be different, to be distinct. Would you pray? That's why we need every family to stay on the wall. Know what you believe, why you believe it. Nail it down. Draw a line in the sand and say, here we are. This is where we stand. I think about the men on staff that are, many of us are younger. We're so important that we stay where we're supposed to stay and stand where we're supposed to stand. If Jesus doesn't come back, we're going to be doing this thing for a while until he comes back. Don't change. Let's not change. Please, God, help us not to change. Lord, I pray that you bless this invitation. Thank you for such a good response, for such a sweet spirit. Thank you for our people allowing us to preach to them like this. Thank you for our pastor and his stand. Faithfully, all these years, the pressure, no doubt the things he's endured, but he stood. And stood with the right spirit, the right position, and the right disposition. I pray that we just continue that as we move forward for the glory of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, All God's people said, amen. amen. Good message. I echo an amen. You see, you agree with all that? Well, maybe a little bit more. Because I don't want to give my life, my wife's life, to this ministry for all these years and then watch it corrupt that your kids have nothing. I might be wrong. You can correct me. I never checked this. But I don't think there was another church, to my knowledge, open in the city of Santa Clara, California these last 15 months. I might be wrong. This church is so very important. And what we believe is so important. July the 4th is a Sunday. July the 5th on that Monday on the Revival Time broadcast would be a patriotic day. But then on the 6th, we move into the book of 2 Timothy. And we'll be there in prior to that. But we'll move into 2 Timothy and Paul said, I'm leaving you, Titus, in Crete. It was a first-generation church. He said, because you're going to have to set some things in order. Your church is already corrupting. There are evil people coming in without sound doctrine and truth. And he said, so I want you to stay with truth. And so he starts with the pastors, and then he goes to the membership. He goes to false teachers. And then he said, you know one of the things you're doing wrong in this church? You're neglecting the aged people that can help guide you, aged women that can help the young girls and aged men. I'm not just talking about a pastor. Aged men in the church that can help the young men. And we're building our churches today off the youth because this is what they want. I love the youth. I go to elementary chapel for 44 years straight. Excuse me. Yeah, that's right, 44 years straight. I go to elementary, preach, lead singing, have a time of my life every week. High school chapel. But I'm not there to figure out what they like. I'm there to preach what they need because I love them too much. And it is working. We're going to keep our Internet friends here with us for a few moments. I want to, I want to say several things to our Internet friends. First, I want to say thank you. Literally in every state, every city, major city especially in America, little hamlets, little villages, little towns, by the thousands and tens of thousands, you have watched in the parking lot this church. You've watched in nursing homes. You've watched in hospitals. Somehow jails have gotten a hold of this. The jails in this community, this area, by the 
Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds have asked for Bibles from this church. We've delivered them not only to this county but surrounding counties. It's just been a miracle. I want to thank our Internet friends for praying for us, loving us, supporting us, encouraging us. And I hope you'll stay with us as we move back in the auditorium on June the 27th. I want you to know that this Sunday we'll be out here. Tonight we remove not the stadium. The stadium is staying here. It will stay here for probably the remainder of the year. The tents will leave shortly. We'll tell you about that. The stadium is going to get changed for Sunday because it's Father's Day, of course, but our youth conference begins on Monday. And uh, it's an Olympic theme, and so you'll see it, but I'll be preaching Sunday morning, Sunday night right here. And I look forward to it. It won't change out here. So we're making provision for this to be moved tonight. We'll talk about that momentarily. I also want to thank the Internet family for uh, loving the ministry here and our church family. I believe the eldest lady that we've had coming in spring, summer, winter, cold, and rain, and fall, Brother Poussin's dear aunt, who's 95 years of age. She's gone to Sunday school every week since we've been open. She has been to Sunday morning. She is a faithful lady. She comes spry. She's happy. She's, I said, you're going to be cold out here. Go, I want to be in church. I love that spirit that she had. We have an army of 80-year-olds that never missed. And I want to thank you for the tremendous example. And then I want to thank down to the youngest family. I've watched you mothers all four seasons push those little strollers in the rain to get your kids in the nursery. And you mothers and dads and you children, you all of you to be commended. Teenagers, you've been amazing. College age students, and of course our college is out. Most are home for the summer, but it's been tremendous. And I want to thank you for last year taking to every 50,000 homes, 130,000 people, a Bible in the city of Santa Clara. I have people that said I never knew about KNBBC and 24 hour day music and radio until in Santa Clara, until this, I listen every day. I'm a faithful listener now. Uh, everyone, almost without fail, said thank you for the Bible. Some actually sent in money and said thank you for getting the Bible out. And I want you to know that I appreciate that. And this year, in the first six months, we've handed out 50,000 Bibles to people. I want to thank you for what you did for the jails, Santa Clara, the women's jail, the men's jail, Juvia Hall, what you did for San Mateo jails, begging for Bibles, and we took them. We never allowed that in the past. I, I want to thank you so very much for helping us stay faithful in church, even in Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. It doesn't, I grew up here, it doesn't hail here, but it, the hail during pastor's conference, people out here in the hail, all the tents, and it was just so well received, the entire conference and what God did. You're an amazing church. And I want to thank you for uh, all you've done. I want to thank you for the debt retirement project during COVID. Ten years ago, 14 years ago, we were $16.5 million in debt. But as of tonight, we're 3.5. Our goal is to pay it off on our 50th anniversary, but we're $700,000 ahead. So by God's grace, we're going to finish it early. Before we let our Internet friends go, our church will be 46 years of age on July 18th. As I sat next to my wife and heard that great message tonight, I looked at these buildings 46 years ago tonight, we owned nothing. This church did not own one thing. We did not own a songbook, an offering plate. We did not own a piano. We did not, we, we did not have a pulpit. We did not own a bus. We didn't have a building. And 46 years ago in July, we began in a little rental building it's been torn down, but there's a Sunnyvale Mall there now. North Valley Baptist Church is Sunnyvale. We stayed there a few months and moved over here to Clyde Avenue, our other property that's filled tonight. 
And we went there, we began to rent the building and eventually bought that building. As I stand before you, as I mentioned earlier, tonight, we have 215,000 square feet of building space. So nearly that property is all paid for. We own two gymnasiums. Uh, we own three dining halls. We own two radio studio studios. We own about 25 or 30 buses, all paid for cash. Last two years ago, 1.5 million for buses. We own a radio station, an internet. Uh, we own computer labs, both properties, media labs. Uh, it's it just, we own a restaurant in here, a coffee shop in here. Uh, we had a racquetball court, but as young people stopped playing racquetball, we turned it into another facility. It, it's just amazing. But 46 years ago, right now, we had nothing. I mean, zero. And then when we did start, we did not start with new psalm books. They had different names of different churches. Most of them did not match. We took duct tape and held some of them together. We got some Lord's table from other churches. We had three sets, and we tried to make them into one. Uh, we had to go get some baskets and made them offering plates. We didn't own a pew, a sound system, nothing. God's been so good. To our internet friends, we want to thank you for watching tonight. And you'll be with us, Lord willing, Sunday morning at 1030 morning service and 6 o'clock. As our internet friends have left us, I want to...